afternoon, Mr. Secretary, if you could please begin. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, members of the City Planning Commission. This is the review session of March 6, 2017, and a quorum is present. Uh, the Department of City Planning today would like to welcome its new director and the chair of the City, City Planning Commission, uh, Marissa Lago. Uh, Thank you. Uh, the first item on today's agenda is a uh, special permit, uh, pursuant to Section 74711, to allow retail use on the ground floor and cell of a building in an M15A district in the Soho Cast Iron Historic District at uh, 62 Green Street. And our presenter is Sylvia Lee uh, from the Manhattan office. Good afternoon, commissioners. This is a private application. Preservation in all districts to allow use group six retail use on portions of the ground floor and the cellar of an existing five story plus penthouse building located at 62 Green Street uh, within an M15A zoning district in the Soho Cast Iron Historic District, Manhattan Community District 2. As shown on the area map, the project site is located on the east side of Green Street, mid block between Groom Street and Spring Street within an M15A district in the Soho neighborhood of Manhattan. The project site um, is within M15A. Um, the surrounding area is predominantly zoned M15A as well, uh, which is the dis light manufacturing district um, that permits light industrial and manufacturing uses up to 5.0 FAR and community facility use up to 6.5 FAR. In the M15A district, use group six retail use is not permitted as the right below the level of second story in buildings larger than 3,600 square feet and lot coverage. The surrounding civil neighborhood um, buildings typically range from three to seven stories in height, consisting of cast iron elevator buildings and low rise brick buildings, uh, brick walk up apartment buildings, uh, primarily uh, along uh, in the southern portion of the Soho neighborhood along uh, Canal Street. Once primarily a manufacturing district, over the years, the area has evolved into a mixed-use district. Today, buildings along Green Street and the Noho ne Soho neighborhood typically house retail stores, art galleries, eating and drinking establishments, and light lighting, furniture showrooms, and wholesalers on the ground floor. The upper floors of many buildings are occupied by commercial offices, joint living workers, artists, lofts, and other types of residences. As shown on the photos here, uh, this stretch of Green Street between Broom and Spring Streets have consistent heights, and many have cast iron facades of varied styles. Uh, here is the project site, 10 Green Street. And this is the subject space, um, which uh, the requested use waiver is located. And shown on the site plan, the subject zoning lot has about 48 feet of frontage on Green Street and measures approximately 4,800 square feet in lot area. Existing non-conforming rear yard of approximately 6 feet uh, at the level of the ground floor and approximately 15 feet uh, deep above the first floor. The site is improved with a five-story building that was constructed for industrial use approximately in 1881. The upper floors of the building were converted to joint living workers for artists in 1981 uh, with four units 
According to the applicants, they are still owned by certified artists. Um, and the building overall is held in cooperative ownership. Sorry. The ground floor of the building has, be, has been leased for the last eight years to um, the sales of architectural building materials, which is uh, conforming use group 16. The lease expires September 2017, and the tenant has informed the applicant that it does not intend to renew the lease. The applicant proposes to use 6,102 gross square feet on portions of the ground floor and the cellar for use group six commercial retail use, shown here in dark gray, see the section here, including 2,029 gross square feet in the cellar and 4,073 zoning square feet on the ground floor. Other aspects of the building would remain unchanged. The proposed development also includes a comprehensive restoration of the facade, storefront, window elements, and masonry party walls as identified in the LPC approved restoration work plan. A long-term maintenance program has been established to ensure the preservation of the building in perpetuity. Section 74711 allows the commission to modify use regulations in the M15A district, provided that certain conditions regarding historic preservation are met and the outlined findings um, can be made. The applicant's discussion of conditions, statement findings, uh, and relevant LPC approvals are included in your packages. Thank you. Any questions from commissioners? <laughs> 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 if that's the case, the application is certified. <laughs> not, not a case of first impression. <laughs> <laughs> Sylvia is going to stay on to present the next item, item number two at 40 Worcester Street. is also a uh, special permit, person section 74711, to allow retail use on the ground floor and cellar and residential use on the upper floors of a six-story building in an M15B zoning district in the Soho Cast Iron Historic District. Um, this is a private application by 40 Worcester Restoration LLC requesting the grant of a special permit pursuant to section 74711 of the zoning resolution to allow use group 6 retail use on the ground floor and cellar and use group 2 residential use on the upper floors of an existing six-story uh, building plus rooftop addition located at 40 Worcester Street within the M15B zoning district in the Soho Cast Iron Historic District, Manhattan Community District 2. <coughs> Um, as shown on the area map, uh, the project site is located on the eastern side of <coughs> Worcester Street, mid-block between Grand and Broom Street within an M15B district. The surrounding area uh, are predominantly, is predominantly zoned M15A and M15B, uh, which again permits light in industrial and uh, commercial uses up to 5 FAR. Uh, in the M15B district, use group six retail use is not permitted in any building below the level of the second story. Um, and use group two residential use is not permitted as of right. Um, again, the area has evolved into a mixed use district uh, along Worcester Street. Um, many of the ground building ground floors are occupied by uh, commercial and retail establishments. Uh, there are also several vacant sites and sites under development in the surrounding area. Uh, adjacent to the project site to the south are two vacant lots. Um, uh, the, the address is 72 to 74 Grand Street. Um, used to be one of the site, one, one of the lots used to be occupied by a one-story building uh, occupied by a commercial establishment. The other uh, used to be occupied by a five-story cast iron building, uh, which was demolished due to the um, a dilapidated condition of the building. Uh, various proposals um, have been put forward on this site, but nothing is in active um, uh, plan as of now. Uh, 27 Worcester Street at the corner of Worcester and Grand Street is a newly construct constructed nine-story mixed-use residential and commercial building. Um, at 52 Worcester Street at the corner of Worcester and Broom Street is uh, a new six-story mixed-use building, uh, which is completing construction. As shown on the site plan, the project site is located mid-block on Worcester between Broome and Grand Street. 
The zoning lot measures approximately 2,553 square feet and has about 25 feet of frontage on Worcester Street. The zoning lot is occupied by an ex existing commercial office building containing about 13,849 square feet of floor area in total and a non-compliant FAR of 5.4. The building was constructed in 1896 as a six-story loft structure and to the best of the applicant's knowledge, it has only been occupied by non-residential users over the years. The applicant acquired the property in April 2014 when the building was about half vacant. Currently, the building houses a variety of commercial offices on the second, fifth, and sixth floors. Um, other upper floors are vacant. The ground floor of the building has been occupied by a non-conforming gallery since September 2015. Um, according to the applicant, the gal gallery is scheduled to vacate the place on um, April 15, 2017. The Department of Buildings has, has been notified um, about the illegal occupancy on the ground floor. Uh, you can see here, this is the um, proposed project site. Um, here's the vacant site to the south. The applicant proposes to convert the existing commercial building to residential use with ground floor retail. A rooftop addition um, is also being proposed as part of uh, the proposed development within the permitted envelope. The applicant proposes to use about 1,833 square feet of ground floor and cellar for use group retail use, shown here in dark gray, and 11,569 uh, square feet on, ground, on portions of the ground floor and the upper floors for use group two residential use. The ground floor would be shared between a um, residential lobby um, and a retail establishment. The cellar would be used for accessory retail and accessory residential use. Um, upper floors of the building would house a total of four residential units. Here are the illustrative upper floor plans. Uh, in total, the project site, uh, the proposed project would have a floor area of 13,403 square feet and 5.2 uh, FAR. Uh, the proposed development also includes a comprehensive restoration of the building as identified in the LPC approval. A long-term maintenance program has also been established. Section 74711 allows the commission to modify the use regulations within the M15B district, provided that um, the listed conditions and findings uh, be made. The applicant discussion of findings and uh, conditions are included in your packages. Thank you. I do have a question about the sequence of events on this one. So the, um, I'll, I'll try it first. Um, the owners purchased the building in April of 2014, leased it to a non-conforming use of a gallery in 2015, and that lease is supposed to run out in April of 17. When did they file the application? Uh, I think it should be noted on your briefing packages. I guess the question is whether it was filed before they entered into the lease with the non-conforming use or what their knowledge was of what they were doing with regard to the non-conforming use. Um, the application was filed um, when the non-conforming use okay. is already in place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When the applicant first came in for um, pre-application process meetings, we are aware of the non-conforming use. Okay, um, and it's, all right. Um, these type of applications to legalize existing nonconformance um, is um, frequently seen here at the department. Uh, the process would be uh, the department informing um, the buildings department to um, do an on-site inspection and issue violation uh, if necessary. I don't know why this seems more like a placeholder for application period, just because we, they knew that the lease would be running out prior to when it went back to community review. There's something about the timing that just um, confuses me a bit. Thank you. And looking to score a hat trick, Sylvia is going to stay on to present <laughs> item number three. 
uh, at uh, 462 Broadway. This is a special permit to allow retail use at the ground floor and cellar and a large retail establishment on floors one, two, and three of an existing six-story building. Um, the commission may recall that this is a private application requesting the grant of two special permits, one special permit pursuant to section 74 at 781. Um, of the zoning resolution, the good faith marketing special permit to allow retail use on portions of the ground floor and the cellar, um, and a second special permit pursuant to section 74922, um, the large retail special permit to allow um, a large retail establishment over 10,000 square feet um, in an existing six story building located at 462 Broadway within an M15B zoning district in the Soho Cast Iron Historic District, Manhattan Community District 2. Shown here um, in delineated in a yellow dash line is the project site. Um, the building has two portions. Um, a circle delineated in a red line is um, the space that the proposed retail establishment is going to be located. Um, as shown on the project site uh, uh, area map, the project site is located at the corner of Grand Street and Broadway um, and has about uh, 200 feet of frontage on Grand Street and 100 feet of frontage each on um, Broadway and Crosby Street. And the surrounding neighborhood is predominantly zoned and one by B district. Again, uh, retail use is not permitted below the level of second story in any buildings in M15B by B district um, and in M1 districts. Uh, certain retail establishments over 10,000 square feet uh, are not permitted as a right and require um, a special permit under Section 74 922. Um, here are some project, uh, photos of the project site. Um, you can see here is the uh, Broadway corridor. Here's Grand Street. Um, uh, this is an older photo. Um, previously, the building. Um, has been largely occupied by the trade school, use, Youth Group 9 Trade School, which is the Culinary Institute. Um, since to, uh, the building uh, has, the Culinary Institute has uh, since consolidated his upper floor accessory office uses and trade school use um, and has vacated the upper second floor and third floor. Um, and currently occupies the northern portions of the building. Um, the ground floor used to be occupied by the trade school as well um, as a student-run restaurant due to the changes of the uh, Culinary Institute business model, educational model. Um, the trade school has el uh, eliminated uh, its uh, restaurant operation on the ground floor, so it's been vacant as well. Uh, as commission may recall, the northern portion of the ground floor used to be occupied by a non-conforming retail use uh, for a number of years, uh, most recently by uh, Joe Fresh. Um, but currently, it's been vacant. The applicant has expressed uh, intent to pursue a separate land use application to allow retail use in the northern portion of the ground floor. Um, but that's not, uh, that is not part of this current land use application. Uh, here are some additional photos of uh, the Crosby Street frontage. See here, this is the uh, southern portion of the building, and here um, are the two service entrances on Crosby Street. As shown on the site plan, the zoning lot measures approximately 20,127 square feet and has about 100 feet of frontage, again, on um, uh, Broadway and 100 on Crosby Street. Um, northern and th southern portions of the building could be accessed separately through various entrances. Um, service entrances are located primarily on the Crosby Street site. The existing building contains approximately 117,274 square feet of floor area and FAR of 5.8. Um, the applicant proposes to use the cellar, southerly, southerly portions of the ground floor and southerly portions of the second floor and third floor for a single large retail establishment. Um, the large retail establishment would have a total zoning floor area of 28,634 square feet, um, amounting to a gross square footage of 45,201 square feet. 
Um, again, the area shaded in blue um, are areas subject to the good faith marking special permit, and the area uh, in, dotted, uh, in red dots are the area subject to the large retail special permit. Specifically, uh, 16,567 gross square feet in the cellar, 8,668 square feet on the ground floor, uh, 9,983 uh, 9, square feet on second floor and third floor would be reoccupied by a single retail establishment. Uh, the rest of the building would be occupied by the use group nine trade school use and uh, use group six offices. Uh, going back to the site plan, uh, the proposed retail establishment um, uh, entrance would be located on Broadway. Uh, goods, a uh, loading and unloading will happen on Crosby Street. Goods could be delivered into the ground floor um, through the service entrances and down to the cellar using the existing street elevators. Section 74781 allows the commission to modify the use regulations in the M15B district to allow retail use below the level of second story, provided that certain findings regarding the owner's good faith marketing efforts could be made. Um, prior to the filing of the application for a period of over a year, the applicant pursued marketing efforts to rent the subject ground floor and cellar space for conforming uses. According to the applicant, despite these efforts, um, there have been no inquiries for long-term use of the vacant space or as a right, uh, heavy, heavy commercial or light manufacturing uses. At the last review session, the com Commissioner 11 raised the applicant has marketed the space for retail use before the requested special permit have been granted. The applicant's attorney submitted a letter to the commission addressing um, that question, stating that the applicant engaged in retail marketing after completing the required uh, one-year marketing period for conforming uses, um, sorry. starting in April 2016. The applicant has um, also revised um, the application materials to reflect um, the re retail marketing efforts. Uh, documentation of the applicant's marketing efforts is provided um, in your packages. Section 74922 allows the commission to modify the use regulations of the M1, M1 district to permit retail establishments over 10,000 square feet, provided that um, the following findings could be made. Uh, which are listed here. The applicant statement findings in response to the large retail special permit is also included in your packages. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Um, Sylvia, two, two questions. Um, I believe when we certified this, this came up um, related to whether or not any uh, windows from the adjacent property would be blocked. Gotcha. Uh, that is the next item, 640. Broadway. I'm sorry, I skipped that. Already. I skipped ahead in my head. Sorry about that. <laughs> Address that, though. Sure. Yes, hi. Um, I guess I have a few questions with respect to the good faith marketing effort. Um, I know the guidelines suggest, you know, sort of three, including but not limited to um, press, brokers, and industry groups. Um, you know, on the surface, I, I guess it looks like they've They've uh, checked these boxes, but I think when you dig a little deeper, I have some concerns about all three of those. Um, you know, with respect to local and citywide press, um, and I recognize you may not be able to answer these, but for the record, you know, I'm, I'm unclear as to whether these publications are um, places where, you know, commercial manufacturing, um, you know, users would go to look in both cases and in the instances they showed us they're the only listings um, for commercial industrial properties in those publications. So it seems that it wouldn't be particularly efficient for anybody to be looking at those publications for these listings. Um, I wonder if the broker, um, Marangoth Properties, um, has experience uh, leasing to industrial or, excuse me, manufacturing uses. Hmm. I think that's important um, to find a broker who actually does this kind of work and has those relationships. I do note that in their call log, there were four calls and they were all incoming. Not a single call was outgoing. Um, so that's a concern. Um, and then the industry groups that 
they mentioned, um, you know, the bulk of them are business improvement districts in the vicinity of this site. Other bids are not the place you go to find potential prospects for manufacturing uses. So, you know, in every instance, when you check this off, there's a real issue um, as to whether, um, you know, this was, uh, you know, just simply to check the boxes and it was procedural um, or it was, in fact, good faith. Um, some of those questions should certainly be addressed by the applicant uh, when the application comes back to the commission. Uh, what I will say is um, due to um, previous um, heightened scrutiny on these good faith marketing applications, um, the department has worked with the borough president's office and local council members' office to come uh, come up with um, a series of guidelines for applicants, um, and some of those issues are raised. So the text does say that, um, for example, uh, the, the space should be listed uh, in local and citywide newspapers. Of course, um, the uh, industry practice of marketing uh, real estate has changed, and uh, we've encouraged applicants to, uh, through their brokers, list um, properties on, online, for example. Um, in regards to the broker, we do advise applicants to find brokers that have experience marketing uh, industrial and commercial uh, properties um, to target um, the audience. Um, that said, um, this area has very little active manufacturing um, activities, so we recognize the difficulty of finding, um, finding uh, targeted industry groups to uh, reach out within um, the immediate vicinity and even um, in the borough of Manhattan. So we do recognize that difficulty um, on the applicant's part. Uh, Sylvia, I certainly share the concerns reflected in your exchange with Commissioner Ortiz um, here. And I but I want to add sort of a, a, a bigger picture one about the course this application has taken to get here. Um, the fact that the um, retail marketing of the marketing of the space for retail use was not disclosed apparently to city planning staff or to the commission before the previous attempt to certify it really calls into question um, for me uh, the applicant's good faith approach to this process. Um, they emphasize in their revised statement of findings their technical compliance with the one-year marketing period. But good faith goes, um, uh, I think, um, a distance beyond um, the narrow letter of the law. So I know this is an issue that's going to come up um, from the community board and the borough president. We'll certainly hear more about it when it gets back to us. But um, I don't think today should pa And I think it's appropriate for it to be certified. Um, we have the information in front of us, but I have a big question in my mind about the overall good faith approach to this. Um, but I want to move on to one other question, and that is about the um, special permit for the large um, retail space. And, I, and these um, large spaces have become increasingly problematic, certainly for the folks in um, Board 2 if they've seen the evolution of SoHo. So I wonder, just for context, Sylvia, could you um, give us some um, sort of overview of how large-scale retail is positioned along this stretch of Broadway? I know there are lots of spaces, um, some of them by special permit that have come through the commission, and so I'd like to know where those are. Um, but I understand from general reading that there's also um, a number of actions taken by DOB and BSA that don't get to us, but that have facilitated the creation of additional large-scale retail. So uh, could you give us a little bit of a primer in large retail spaces in Soho? Yeah, sure. Um, so just to back up a little bit, um, citywide, the commission um, over the years have approved um, many large retail establishments all over the city and all boroughs. Uh, so in Soho, um, the commission has approved four large retail establishments, um, and I can go through them. One, uh, the most recent one is 19 East Houston Street, uh, you may recall, um, which was approved by the commission in 2014, but withdrew a city council, um, which is located further north along Houston Street. Um, 
And uh, there is also 300 Lafayette Street, which was also approved um, by the commission and council in 2014, uh, which is a, a commercial uh, new development with offices on the upper floors and a retail, uh, a large retail uh, establishment on the ground floor. Um, but the building hasn't been constructed yet, so it's at the corner of um, Lafayette and uh, Houston Street, so um, the south side. Um, and then there is Banana Republic um, at 50, 550 and 556 Broadway, uh, which is located um, north of Spring Street, um, just outside of the map of the area map, uh, which is the Banana Republic, and was approved by the Commission and Council in 2010. Um, and then there is 610 Broadway, uh, which, is, uh, which was approved in 2003. Um, it is the site of the new uh, Adidas store on, on Houston Street on the eastern side of Broadway. So those are the four applications um, in, approved in Soho to um, allow large retail establishments. Um, of course, as you know, Commissioner Levin mentioned, um, the CPC large retail establishment is not the only mechanism mm -hmm. uh, to allow large retail to um, exist in the Soho area. Um, given the you know commercial history of Broadway, um, stores may have been grandfathered. For example, um, I think here shown here it is the Zara store, which used to be. Uh, Old Navy, um, and the ground floor has a grandfathered use group 10A, large retail use. Um, and other mechanisms could be um, through um, stores being classified um, as uses that are not subject to the uh, floor area cap. For example, um, use group uh, 6C sporting goods store is not subject to the 10,000 square feet. Um, uh, floor area cap, um, so Nike, the new Nike town on Broadway um, um, is allowed um, through that. Um, and other types of stores, um, there are also um, wholesalers that are not subject to the floor area restriction, um, but they also deal with individual consumers as well. Um, and there are stores that meet certain criteria um, that I am not fully familiar with, meet certain criteria to be considered um, for example, in an aggregate of smaller separate establishments, um, um, and they could get um, a use group six um, certificate of occupancy instead, um, instead, instead, instead of being considered a large retail establishment. So some of the other big, we've got plenty of other big ones like Uniqlo and Bloomingdale's, and I don't know, I don't spend enough time hanging around over there to know, but um, it's, a, it's a bigger bigger picture than just these special permits. Yeah. Thank you, and thanks for collecting the information. Thank you. Um, I have a, a question about the department's um, regulations, if there are any, about the broker aspect of the good faith marketing. Um, if I recall correctly from um, the ownership chain that we received, Marengoff is affiliated with the owner of the building. And I'm just wondering if that creates a disincentive for a broker to market a property for something counter to the um, uh, use group that's being proposed. Um, thanks for raising that. So far, that has not been uh, part of our uh, good faith marketing guideline, but we could certainly look into it. Um, I think that's a good point. Touch on how the fair market price is established for the advertising of the uh, property. Um, as the commission uh, is well aware, uh, there are very, very few, uh, if any, handful of um, active manufacturing establishments in the neighborhood. So, it's challenging to establish a fair market rent for industrial use in this neighborhood. Um, what the department has done is to advise applicants to work with brokers uh, familiar with the area and brokers familiar with industrial properties to set a rent um, that they deem is appropriate. Um, so as you may have seen, um, in this case, the applicant initially marketed the space for $400 per square foot, and the, app, uh, the department, $400 per square foot, um, initially, yeah. 
um, and the department has uh, advised the applicant to lower that rent as it's closer to um, a retail rent uh, in the neighborhood and certainly much more than what uh, industrial broker uh, industrial space would would be able to afford um, but the department hasn't um, definitely the department doesn't prescribe um, the rent um, and it's something that the applicant needs to justify um, and defend This time I have an, a question on this application. Um, go, going to the, the special permit findings, the first one is that the use is located to draw a minimum of vehicular traffic at, traffic to and through local streets. So what what are we what have we asked the applicant so far to provide to, to demonstrate that that's not going to happen? Uh, so as you can see, the applicant uh, provided narratives in their response uh, to the findings of 74922. Um, I believe, as I recall, the applicant said is that this is a, um, an area that is well served by public transit. Um, and um, so it, it would not so no traffic, draw a lot no of traffic study. That's uh, no, typically, yeah. But as part of the environmental review, um, traffic is something that they um, had to look into. I was just wondering if we had a copy or, or are we privy to that information as far as the uh, market analysis from the broker, you know, showing the specific properties that they compared the assessment to, you know, the subject property to. We can ask the applicant to provide. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm listening to this colloquy and it keeps coming up time and time again in the same area. I, I'm wondering if... Uh, I know windmills uh, connote industrial, but I'm wondering if we're tilting against windmills. It seems to me over the years, over the past few years, the market is telling us they don't want to do what the code says, so they're going to play every game they can in order to be able to come up with something that they see marketable for them on not only an initial basis, but on a long-term basis. And instead of concentrating on forcing the issue, is it time for us to be reviewing the issue? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so as the, um, the, the former uh, Chair Weisbrod um, has mentioned in previous um, public meetings at the Commission, um, the Department has been looking at um, the existing conditions in the Soho area um, and working collaboratively with the Manhattan Borough President um, and Council Member Margaret Chin's office. Um, and we've um, completed an initial data collection and uh, conducted some initial analyses. Um, that said, um, the next steps of this study will um, will be briefing um, our new chair um, with some additional discussions and we'll definitely come back to the commission uh, to talk about um, the status of um, our analysis um, and um, that's, that is something that we can follow up with the Commission at a later time. Yes. Thank you. Um, you know, following along those lines, I, I was curious in reading uh, this information that, you know, whether we had any evidence that uh, any of these good faith uh, efforts had resulted in, in actually leasing to the uses, or if it's simply sort of a bureaucratic, uh, you know, check checklist, um, because then it would go to you know Commissioner Cantor's point, and you're sh just shaking your head, <laughs> no, Michelle, but, no, no. but <laughs> um, you know, because I think that raises a, a good point that that we should take into consideration. Thank you. I just wonder if the in, in the interim before anything is resolved on a new plan, if it makes sense to commission an appraisal for manufacturing space just so that there's at least an understanding of what the market is so that it wouldn't have to be subject on each application. I'm not recommending that. I'm just asking. <laughs>
and more broadly. And as Sylvia has indicated, this is something obviously that we will have to come back to discuss more fulsomely with the commission. I do think, however, that for purposes of this application, it's certified, although with an understanding of these various issues that have been raised by a number of commissioners. Thank you. Changing pace a little bit to item number four. Uh, it's uh, 640 Broadway. Uh, this is a uh, 74 711 special permit to modify height and setback regulations to allow the construction of penthouse additions on an existing nine story residential building. This is coming back from review at the Community Board and Borough President. And Sylvia Lee is here to tell you about it. <laughs> Uh, the Commission may recall that this is a private application returning a pre-hearing item after review by the Manhattan Community Board 2 and Manhattan Borough President. I'll get into the details of their recommendations after a brief, a brief overview of the project. Um, the applicant requests the grant of special permit pursuant to Section 74711 of the Zoning Resolution to modify height and setback regulations and the rooftop recreational space requirements um, of the M15B Zoning District to facilitate the construction of penthouse additions in an existing nine-story building located at 640 Broadway in the NoHo Historic District, Manhattan Community District 2. And the narrow through block nine-story building is shown here. Um, adjacent is an office building that is overbuilt. As shown on the area map, the project site is located on Bleecker Street in the south side of uh, Bleecker Street uh, between uh, Broadway and Cross Broadway and Crosby Street, within the M15B zoning district, immediately east of the Special Little Italy um, <coughs> district, which is a commercial district that allows retail and residential use. The maximum FAR permitted uh, in the M15B district is five for commercial and manufacturing. Um, the district permits a maximum base height of 85 feet or six stories, whichever is less. And above the maximum base height, the building shall be set back from the street line, and the bulk is governed by sky exposure plane. Buildings containing 15 or more joint living workforce artists are required to dedicate a minimum of 30% up to 50% of the roof area um, as recreational space accessible for all building occupants. Um, the site is located in the neighborhood of NoHo. Um, a vibrant mixed-use mix area characterized by loft buildings ranging from 5 to 13 stories in height. Uh, many former industrial lofts um, have been converted to office use or a variety, variety types of um, residences. Um, currently, predominant uses in the surrounding area um, includes ground floor retail um, and a mix of uses on the upper floors. Um, here is the subject building again. Um, you can see the upper floors, well, you can't see, the upper floors are occupied by joint living work artists, uh, which are actually, um, there are 21 units, uh, 20 of the units um, are actually legalized under the loft law, um, which are classified as joint living workers artists on um, COs, but they do not require occupancy of certified artists. Um, so they're actually residential lofts. Um, and one of the units um, is occupied by a certified artist. Um, you can see on the ground floor, occupied by um, um, a number of use group six uh, commercial retail establishments. And the building has a CO documenting these uses. Um, here is the building elevation. You can see the roof. There is a bulkhead and um, staircases um, providing access to the roof. The zoning lot measures approximately 5,157 square feet with about 20 feet of frontage on Broadway um, and 27 feet of frontage on Crosby Street. Um, the building on site um, has a legal non-compliant FAR of 8.87. Um, here is a slide showing the existing roof plan on the top and the proposed um, uh, penthouse addition, um, which was presented to the commission at certification. Um, at certification, the applicant stated that their, uh, the penthouse would include approximately, um, sorry, uh, as shown, sorry, as shown on the proposed penthouse plan here, uh, the applicant proposes to construct penthouse additions using approximately 2,300 square feet floor area reallocated 
from elsewhere in the building. Um, the floor area reallocation is facilitated by additional mechanical deductions for new mechanical equipment throughout the building um, and reorganizations, mergers of market rate units um, on floors two, three, five, eight, nine. Um, with the penthouse additions, buildings would have an FAR of 8.85 and slightly less zoning floor area than um, its current legal non-compliant condition due to the mechanical deductions and mergers of units, of course. Um, the, the two penthouses will form a part of a triplex and duplex with the units immediately below on the ninth floor. Uh, the commission had questions at certification about the nature of the new mechanical deductions. Uh, the applicant will provide um, additional information on that um, at public hearing. Um, here are some conceptual renderings of proposed penthouses um, as shown portions of the roof um, would be provided um, as private terraces. Um, the proposed penthouse additions would increase the building height by about 12 feet and would increase the building's bulk noncompliance with regards to the height and setback regulations. Uh, so um, this is the existing roof. Um, the roof is unimproved. Um, as you are aware, um, the zoning re resolution um, requires that a minimum of 30 to 30 percent up to 50 percent of the roof area to be dedicated to um, recreational space for all building occupants um, but there are no um, requirements in the res in the zoning resolution for um, the space and there are no amenities required um, so, um, as you can see here none is provided um, the roof currently has about 3,296 square feet um, of accessible common area um, and 2,128 square feet is the required amount of rooftop recreational space. Um, due to the, um, uh, due to the uh, proposed penthouse addition um, at certification, um, the applicant proposed to eliminate the rooftop recreational space. Specifically, the proposed penthouse additions would further encroach into the initial 20 feet setback from Bleecker Street above the maximum height and penetrate the sky exposure plane, um, as shown in sections here taken perpendicular uh, to Broadway. Um, here is the penthouse plan showing the uh, encroachment um, outside of the envelope. Um, here is the penthouse roof plan. Section 74711 allows the commission to modify use and bulk regulations provided that certain conditions regarding historic preservation are met and outlined findings can be made. The applicant's discussion of conditions and statement of findings are included in your packages. The application was referred out to Manhattan Community Board 2 on November, 12, uh, November 28, 2016. Uh, in response to the community board's concerns regarding the loss of rooftop recreational space, the applicant presented an alternative proposal um, to the, this community board and borough president with a reduced penthouse uh, configuration that's about half the size. Um, according to the applicant, this reduction would allow the continued provision of the rooftop recreational space. Um, both the Community Board and Borough President recommended approval of the alternative proposal, which the applicant will present to the Commission at public hearing. Um, that's it for now. And I'll, I'll address the question um, about the uh, lot line windows, whether um, they will be blocked. Um, according to uh, the applicant's project description um, at the certified, uh, version of the proposal, um, five windows um, of the adjacent um, commercial building would be blocked. Um, in their um, alternate proposal, um, two lot line windows um, will be blocked. Thank you. You referenced the uh, reallocation of space between low levels and the new, and uh, could you explain how that was being created or, or uh, measured? Um, according to the applicant, uh, the building is being renovated um, 
and there will be new mechanical equip equipment installed uh, throughout the building. Um, so the applicant is proposing to take more mechanical, additional mechanical deductions. Um, and some of the market rate units in the building are being uh, reorganized and merged, creating double height spaces, eliminating uh, floor plates, uh, which also enable, enables the applicant to, to, to have more floor area. A little bit of history. Um, is the department analyzing the creation of the new mechanical space so that it indeed cannot be converted to rentable space or FAR space equivalency after the job is approved? And I ask for that based upon a specific history where applicants took required spaces of maybe 100 square feet, made it into 200 square feet, and had no, the only motive over there was to create an FAR uh, by changing from required to mechanical. And I would ask that the department specifically look to what's proposed to assure ourselves that mechanical space cannot be easily converted to offer into functioning space. Um, department staff reviewed drawings um, that shows where the mechanical deductions are and where um, the residential floor area is located, but um, we do not analyze um, the aspects of the building that are not under our preview. Say that again, please. Uh, we, we haven't analyzed um, mechanical deductions, uh, at, le at least the portions of the building that are not under um, our preview. Mm -hmm. Under your under purview. Your purview, sorry, purview. I, I would uh, respectfully take exception to that. If indeed, and I'm not, I have not looked at the plans, there's no reference, there's no implication here that this applicant is doing anything wrong. But if a mechanical space is created, particularly with some of these 10 foot high and 12 foot high floor. The mechanical space is created that needs to be 200 square feet and is put into a space that is 300 square feet with the obvious opportunity of having it converted from 300 square feet of mechanical space down to 200 or maybe even less as has been in the past then I do think it's under our purview because it's a way around the intent of the code, the intent of the law. Uh, I believe the buildings department would be doing an uh, extensive review of the, uh, the drawings uh, in order to grant uh, building permits uh, for um, new mechanical deductions um, and new uh, construction. Once Lens, again, based within on the building. History, I would suggest that at the very least this department put a bullet in what they're sending to the building department to, ask her to, to at least alert them to the fact that we would expect a close review of new mechanical area which may be, may be convertible to usable space after occupancy. Sure. As, as, as Sylvia mentioned, the Verification and enforcement of floor area compliance is the responsibility of the Department of Buildings. Right. However, if uh, if something is brought to our attention, a potential violation, certainly we would alert DOB and we would work with them to make sure that... Um, we gave a guy a very tough time after we found out what he was trying to do. Mm -hmm. I would suggest that uh, if the applicant is in the room, uh, he should recognize that we'll probably give him a hard time too. <laughs> Message, I'm sure, is heard. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I'm just wondering, I guess I'm not remembering since I've been on the commission whether we've had a, a similar application where the proposal, the proposed change got modified so substantially by the community board and the borough president that the, I'm just wondering, is there any need is there any potential impact in the modification um, to the continuing maintenance program? It's a significant reduction in square footage for the penthouse. I don't know if that represents, a, I'm assuming it may represent a significant reduction in revenue to them, which may impact on their ability to comply with the continuing maintenance program. And I don't know if there's 
been a follow uh, a loop back with LPC on this? Um, we've advised the applicant to reach out to LPC um, and present the alternative proposal. Yeah. Um, the continued maintenance program has been established, but the restrictive declaration uh, stipulating uh, the program has not been executed or recorded. Usually that's done uh, right before the commission's vote. Um, so I believe there's still time uh, if changes need to be made. Um, and we'll report back. Um, and we'll have to, uh, the commission will uh, receive the modified LPC approval as well um, before the vote. Hi. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, I, you know, I see that they um, are now offering the, the required rooftop recreation space, um, which is great. I mean, one, one of the issues that we had previously is that the space was unimproved, um, so obviously it was not being used. Um, and it wasn't clear uh, whether tenants understood that they had a right to that space. Um, you know, in the petition that was distributed, it just simply said, we don't use it. <laughs> um, and so you can take it from us, not that they acknowledged they had a right to it and that they were giving up a right. Um, so I wondered, you know, to what extent uh, the applicant uh, plans to improve the space, uh, at least minimally, so that it can be used um, <laughs> and provide a signage and, you know, public notification or notification to residents in, in the form of signage that this space is theirs as a, as a right um, so that, you know, we can prevent this from happening and per potentially the appropriation of the space over time as private space. Um, it's important that we acknowledge that it, it is available to the residents. Thank you. Um, the applicant team is here um, and they could provide additional information on that and what their plans are for the um, uh, rooftop recreational space after the construction of the penthouse and see how much space would be provided and whether there will be any amenities. Um, the applicant will follow up uh, at the public hearing. So, so I have a question concerning the, um, the joint living work quarters for artists. So yes. in 1988, through a residential law determination and under the law law, um, the building was converted to 21 JW, JLWPA units. And then on, on another page, you cite that the 2008 Certificate of Occupancy notes that pursuant to Article 7C of the Multiple Dwelling Law, 20 of the 21 existing JLWPA units can be occupied by non-certified artists in accordance with the 1987 amendment to the definition of the JLWPA, QA. So I guess my question is more to try and understand how that works, because it seems like we do have a lot of applicants who come in for joint living work quarters for artists. And you know, we, we stipulate that the building's JW, L, JLWQA, but it seems like there's a 1987 amendment out there to the definition of JLWQA that can kind of stymie all these applications. Can you go elaborate on that, please? Uh, so, uh, the, with regards to the history of this building, um, the units have been legalized under the law of law, which is the Article 7C of the Multiple Dwelling Law. Um, we understand that the building's department um, documents these units legalized under the law law with the same use group as a joint living workforce of artists that needs to be occupied by a certified artist. Um, so we understand that this, this may be um, a practice issue instead of um, a question with regards to how um, the, the, the unit needs to be occupied. So in terms of this building, it, there is clarity in that, um, there, the units do not require artist occupancy. Um, and for, uh, with regards to the uh, zoning text amendment to um, broaden the definition of joint living work with artists um, in the zoning decks, um, that happened, um, um, I believe, um, concurrently or subsequently to the uh, amendment to the multiple dwelling law which um, established um, the law of law to um, allow residential conversions in loft districts and in Soho and NoHo. And zoning text was amended to uh, address um, uh, to address that change in the M15A and M15B regulations. So then is it possible that 
someone else who's developing a building in, in this neighborhood can change their job, JW, JLWPA requirements and just? Not if they are not, um, not, not if they do not have um, a loft status filed, registered with the loft board. So the loft board does have a list of buildings um, that have the legal loft status. Um, either um, they are still go undergoing a legalization process where they've been legalized under the loft law and they've been issued certificate of occupancy. Um, an, a, a building that does not have a history of loft living and did not file for legal status under the loft board would not be able to take advantage of the provision. Thank you. We're going to let Sylvia take a break now and move on to uh, item number five, which is on page 165 of your package. Uh, this is also coming back uh, to the City Planning Commission after being heard at the Community Board and Borough President. Uh, 19 East 70th Street is a 74 cent loan special permit to modify the bulk regulations to facilitate conversion of an existing six story building to a single family house. Uh, Stephen Johnson, the Manhattan office, is here to tell you what happened at the Community Board. Good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon, Commissioners. This is a private application by NY 70th Street, LLC, for the property located at 19 East 70th Street for a special permit pursuant to ZR Section 74711. <laughs> to facilitate the renovation and conversion of an existing six-story landmark building back to a single-family home, the renovation will increase the zoning floor area by 127 square feet to a total of 15,452 square feet as part of the 74711 the applicant is seeking the following waivers. First, uh, minimum distance between the lot line and legal windows, the intercourt regulations for minimum dimension and for minimum area, and height limitations for narrow buildings or enlargements. The project was referred on December 12, 2016, and is back for the pre-public hearing view, and I'll give you a brief uh, rundown of the project. So the building is located on the Upper East Side Historic District and Community District 8 of Manhattan. As you can see from our area map here, uh, the project site is right here. Um, it's on the, uh, this is the Frick right here, the Frick Collection, Central Park, obviously, and St. James, oh, sorry, St. James Church is right there. Uh, the building was completed in 1910 as a townhouse and as an individual landmark designated in 1974, along with the four other adjacent buildings. Uh, it is located within the special Madison Avenue Preservation District, which runs from 61st to 96th Street and was created in 1973 with the goal to preserve and protect the unique character and architectural quality of Madison Avenue. The building is in a C-51 zoning district, which is a residential equivalent of an R-10. This permits a maximum FAR of 10 for residential and a basic maximum FAR of 4 for commercial use. Fifth and Park Avenues, the uh, adjacent avenues are also mapped R-10 while the mid blocks are mapped with the lower density contextual R8B. So we have a couple historic photos here of the building facade. Uh, first is, uh, on the left is a tax photo from 1940, and on the right is uh, from 1915, from the fifth floor. And then you can see the, the upper floors, the very upper floors of the building. Um, the building is a six story, Neo-Italian Renaissance style townhouse that is 30 feet wide with a depth of 100 feet. The lot has a depth of 100 feet. The existing building height is 93 inches feet and not two inches and the roof of the penthouse and the proposed building height is the same as the existing building height. It was converted to office use in 1952. 1952 was later used as an art gallery starting in 1972. In 2011, the building was deeded to East Renaissance LLC and the current owner purchased the building in 2014, intended to use it as a personal residence. We're looking at uh, the rear yard photos, uh, the rear yards of the building, and the ones next to it. This is the subject building here. That's the copper wrapped penthouse, the existing copper wrapped penthouse on the site. Um, 
This is the main area where a number of the uh, waivers are required. The photo on the left is a stitched together photo of a couple different photos. We have the penthouse, 654321, and then a sub cellar area. It has a courtyard. Um, and we have another set of photos from Madison Avenue. This is the commercial uh, district along Madison Avenue. You can see the building at the top. Again, the copper wrapping is the easiest marker here on the building. The building adjacent to it is also a landmark building, and this is a two-story commercial building there along Madison Avenue. We have the rear yard uh, open space diagram. We often refer to this as the donut and the donut hole. Um, um, you can see the subject buildings here. This is the Frick over here. These are all landmark buildings, and of course the Frick is also landmark building. So our AXO, it gives you an idea of what the existing of the building is and the proposed on the right. So the existing building contains 15,325 square feet with an FAR of 5.09 and the proposed building would increase the zoning floor area again by 127 feet. Uh, this is increases primar primarily due to the elimination of an air shaft and the moving of mechanical equipment on the upper floors. The total gross square feet is proposed to be increased by approximately 3,000 square feet to 22,839 square feet. This is due to the excavation of two sub-cellar levels. So we have our roof plan, uh, site plan here. And you can see uh, the different waiver sections here. The first, um, you can see the rear yard waivers here, and I have some more waivers to show you that will show it in more detail. This is the air shaft, and this is the mechanical. This is the front of the, bu the building, and this is uh, Madison Avenue coming down this way. So um, this slide. The existing building on the left is the, uh, how the building is now, and the proposed is on the right. Uh, the waiver section shows the two waivers for the pre-existing non-compliance in the rear yard. First is the 30-foot distance from the lot line to legal windows. And the second shows the line for minimum area dimension, which is 12,000 or 1,200 square feet, sorry. So this is uh, the, the lot line, 30 feet mark here. And then this one is for the 40 foot um, minimum area for a court. And then we have our next waiver section, uh, again with the existing and the proposed. Um, the existing building has a height of 90 three feet and two inches and the roof of the penthouse of the proposed building is the same. And you can see the proposed outline. This is the existing building, just showing you where the height is from the existing and also onto the proposed. So there's no increase, increase to the height of the building. Um, so the applicant is proposing an overall restoration and rehabilitation of the landmark building, including the rear facade and the rooftop with the original copper sheet metal materials. Your briefing package includes all the appropriate LPC design approval documents. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the applicant is seeking to waive sections of the ZR to allow for the enlargement and conversion. The first waiver is for inner court regulations, which require the area of an inner court cannot be less than 1,200 square feet, and the minimum dimension of the inner court cannot be less than 30 feet. The existing depth of the rear yard is 10 feet by 30 feet for a total of 300 feet. The second waiver is for minimum distance between building, which requires a minimum dimension of 30 feet for the lot line for legal windows. The proposed Rear facade of the building from the rear lot line ranges from 10 feet on the cellar on the first floor, 13 feet on the second floor, and then 21 feet on the third floor. And the final waiver is for height limitations for narrow buildings or enlargements, which limits the building height on interior lots to a height equal to the width of the street, which is 60 feet. So the waiver is for the proposed new bulk above the 60-foot line. So the special permit requires that the bulk mod shall have minimal adverse effects on structures or open space in the vicinity in terms of scale, location, and access to light and air. And the commission may prescribe appropriate additional conditions and safeguards which will enhance the character of the development. And for the public review in a letter dated January 17, 2017, Committee Board 8 voted to approve the application by a vote of 35 in favor, one opposed, one abstaining, and one not voting for cause. And in a letter dated February 27, 2017, the Manhattan Borough President recommended approval with no conditions. Questions from commissioners? Thank you. Stephen, uh, yes. voting the one vote for cause, I think, as you characterized it, 
Not voting for cause. Not voting for cause. Yeah. There was no explanation as oh. why they did that. Oh, okay, thank you. It was 35 in favor, though, and one opposed. One abstain. Um, Stephen, I noticed just in passing by that neighborhood that I think the building adjacent to the east is also under construction now. Uh, do we know what's going on there, and does it have any relation to this project? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, they haven't brought that to my attention at all. Okay. Uh, we did do one of, we, another one of the buildings in, in the rear. We did this maybe right. a year ago here. But right. I don't know about the one next to it. Okay, but, we could, I could okay, but it's not related to this one as far as you not know. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. It looks like it's near and Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and, it's, and, and the corner too, the retail space is yeah. getting worked on. So it's a busy street. Yeah. Thank you. Just wait for the frick. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and I'd like to um, uh, say that this is a different application than the last one um, that I think was unanimously approved um, to the north of it. But um, I do raise the same concern, uh, not uh, <clears throat> anything about the application per se, but rather that with the increasing number of 20,000 square feet Foot plus single-family homes in a very small geographic area, um, uh, I suspect at some point it will become unfashionable again, as it was when these were first um, constructed in the turn of the century. And I am concerned about what was a wholesale renovation of many of these houses into, um, uh, for lack of a better word, illegal smaller units, whether they were offices or apartments. And I know it falls outside of the jurisdiction of this commission, but I would like to encourage the buildings department to encourage sprinkler systems as a requirement in these larger single family homes so that when they are ultimately broken up, there is a chance that there will be some safety associated with them. Item number six on page 221 of your package uh, regarding 1366 Madison Avenue is a City Planning Commission certification to modify the special use regulations of the Special Madison Avenue Preservation District to allow community facility use on the ground floor. Um, Stephen Johnson is also going to present that application. So this is a private application by Play Garden Associates, LLC, for the property located at 1366 Madison Avenue for a commission certification pursuant to Zoning Resolution Section 92032 to modify the special use regulations of Section 9903 related to the Special Madison Avenue Preservation District to allow a community facility use of a daycare center on the ground floor of a six-story predominantly residential building in Community District 8 of Manhattan modify the regulations to allow for the community facility use. Uh, the commission must find that the treatment of the facade preserves and enhances street life on Madison Avenue and is compatible with the character of the surrounding area. The proposed daycare uh, service will the proposed facility will offer daycare services as well as early childhood classes and education for children up to five years of age. The facility will contain uh, 3,915 square feet of floor area and uh, the proposal will not increase the floor area or the height of the building. The application was filed on December 1st, 2016, and subsequently referred to the community board for review on January 13th, 2017. And I'll take you through the project now. Uh, as you can see from our area map here, the building is a corner lot. It's right here, 96 Madison. Um, it's on the southwest corner and has approximately 100 feet of street frontage on Madison Avenue and 145 feet of street frontage on East 96th Street. The building was completed in 1930 as a six-story, 70-foot tall mixed-use residential building and now has 38 units and 78,500 square feet of floor area and 5,500 square feet of retail space on the ground floor. The building was located in R10 district while the easternmost 100 feet along Madison Avenue it is located in a C5, sorry, C15 commercial overlay zoning district. The proposed daycare facility would have 45 feet along a frontage along Madison Avenue and be entirely located within the special Madison Avenue preservation district, uh, also known as the MP. So the MP uh, runs from 61st Street to 96th Street along Madison Avenue, it was created in 1973. 
uh, with the purpose uh, to preserve and protect the unique character and architectural quality of Madison Avenue and to enhance street life by promoting specialty shops at street level and to, and to introduce amenities related to the residential character of the area. To achieve these goals, the MP regulates the use and bulk of developments and enlargements. Ground floor commercial uses are required on buildings with frontage on Madison Avenue, and the MP further identifies the permitted commercial uses and restricts community facility uses. Um, the surrounding area is characterized by predominantly four to 19 story residential uses, most with ground floor commercial retail. There are a handful with community facility uses. For example, this is uh, Hunter College High School on the entire block. It's within the MP district here. Um, just below that is the 32 story residential tower, Carnegie Hill Towers. The Diller Quali School of Music is located on East 95th Street right here, that's in the MP district, and there's an uh, Italian language private school on 96, but that is not within the MP district, but it's right next to the property. So we have a front facade photo uh, from the street level, looking west at Madison Avenue, from Madison Avenue at the frontage of the building. Uh, as you can see, there's two retail spaces. The Starbucks is on the corner, and the proposed uh, daycare facility is located right next to it. Uh, the space was a former liquor store. So this is the East 96th Street frontage. You can see the Starbucks on the corner and the entrance to the building with no other ground floor retail there. And here we have a photo uh, looking south along Madison Avenue at the different uh, street frontage here. You can see on the, on the cross the street, there's a couple small retail shops. The building next to it does not have any commercial retail. The building next to the subject property also does not have any ground floor retail. This is the armory, the, the ex previous, the, the armory building that's now the Hunter College High School, and that's Carnegie Hill Towers in the background. Uh, so we have a basic site plan here illustrating the subject building, the entrance to the building for the play garden, proposed play garden is right here. That would be the Starbucks entrance right there. These are all uh, ground floor retail uses. The MP extends across East 96th Street to get the corner lots on all four sides. This is where there's no ground floor retail here or on that site. So the proposed frontage of the play garden, uh, there's no change to the existing bronze aluminum architecture uh, along the top or to any change. There's no change to the cornice to the building. Uh, the, there will be clear glazing on the glass storefront with play garden signage. Land Parks Preservation Commission issued a certificate of no effect on October 20th of last year and approved the building's proposed facade changes that will be altered in the following ways. First, the non-historic double door entrance to the daycare facility on Madison Avenue will be replaced by a single door entrance, and that's right here. That will now be a single door. You can see the little tiny green signs. That's the, the play garden signs. The entrance door and interior face of the storefront glass will contain removable vinyl signage for the daycare facility that reads Play Garden Prep. And the bottom half of the interior storefront glass will contain opaque screening in order to provide privacy for the preschool use. And that's this dotted line. You can't really tell that it's dotted in this diagram, but I think you can on your uh, packages. So the application is for a certification from the commission pursuant to CR section 99032 to modify the special use regulations to allow a community facility, daycare facility on Madison Avenue. And the finding is that the treatment of the facade preserves and enhances street life on Madison Avenue and is compatible with the character of the surrounding area. According to the applicant, the proposed daycare will be consistent with the existing residential and retail character of the area and will complement residential uses by providing daycare services to the predominantly residential neighborhood. And because the facade treatment for the daycare and existing storefront will remain predominantly the same, it will preserve the existing Street, Wall, and Madison Avenue will be compatible with the existing commercial character of the avenue. So this was referred over to the community board and they responded with a letter dated February 13, 2017, and they voted unanimously to approve the application. Thank you. Um, uh, will the applicant tell us what uh, what they will do for lighting after hours? Um, there is something particularly neighborhood 
positive about the Starbucks being open later into the evening. And if that's a dark facade, that really is a very long run of um, dark facades leading up to it and also on the other side. Well, I think, um, I think it'll be consistent with what is existing there today. There's no public hearing for this project. Um, and I think the glazing provides some more transparency with the street front. But uh, I think the proposed uh, lighting system will be the same as the existing. I don't think there's any additional. Right, the previous work. tenant was a wine merchant that was open into the evening. I, I, I don't know the hours of the daycare center, but I'm, I, guess, I guess it's not going to be hearing, so I will not find out until it's installed. <laughs> Um, Stephen, actually, I have a, a related question, and that is about the um, uh, white dot matrix screen. I'm reading the fine print here. Uh -huh. the, 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 the privacy screening that you described uh -huh. being on the lower half of the right. windows. Um, so do I take it there's no, you know, transparency has been an important issue for us uh, in retail as we've gotten smarter and smarter about how we do it. Um, mm -hmm. Do I take it that there is no transparency requirement or in the MP or that this complies there with it? There uh, isn't explicitly in the MP, but there is regulations uh, in the uh, historic district that requires a certain amount of transparency to meet, to meet those requirements. And this meets it, yeah. I mean, I certainly understand for the daycare use that um, the screening is appropriate, but it, but it does intrude on the, you know, the activity that's presented by um, folks inside these retail spaces. So I kind of get it. I get we get it, balance it. But if they comply with the rules they on the comply. books, then They'll have uh, 266 <laughs> square feet of glazing. 176 square feet of that will be transparent, which is 66%. That means okay. the regulations. Thank you. Other questions on the commission? OK, so since this is a commission certification, I would ask for a set from the commission by a show of hands, and it would be a sent to send an approval letter to the Department of Buildings in favor. Opposed? OK, so approved. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item number seven is uh, the LM applicability text amendment, which is a zoning text amendment to allow bonus public plazas on lots within 50 feet of a street which require retail or street wall continuity within the special lower Manhattan district. Richard Suarez of the Manhattan office will present the proposed text to you. Good afternoon, commissioners. This is a private application for a zoning text amendment to section 9124 of the zoning resolution relating to locations within the Special Lower Manhattan District where the public plaza bonus is permitted. Currently, a development or enlargement that is on or near certain designated streets is not permitted a floor area bonus, no matter how far the plaza is from that street. The proposed text amendment would instead allow the location of the plaza in relation to the designated street to dictate a site's eligibility for a public plaza bonus. The applicant is, de is a developer of a new residential building with frontage on Fulton Street a designated street that currently prohibits the site from receiving a public plaza bonus, and with the public plaza located around the corner on William Street. The proposed text amendment would allow the developer the development to obtain a public plaza bonus, provided that the plaza is a sufficient distance away from Fulton Street. The Special Lower Manhattan District is a special zoning district that was adopted in 1998 to simplify and consolidate a myriad of overlapping and complex zoning and urban design regulations into one comprehensive set of regulations. The district extends south uh, from Murray Street, City Hall Park, and the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, it extends south and encompasses the entirety of the southern part of the tip of the island, with the exception of Battery Park City, which is west of West Street. Um, within the district are the high density C53, C55, C69, and C64 districts that are consistent with the special district's role as a central business district, but also as an increasingly mixed use district. Again, just to orient us, so here's City Hall Park, Broadway is the spine here, we have West Street on the west, South Street on the east, and then the bridge, and then Fulton Street comes right in here, and Wall Street cuts across there. This text amendment focuses on the C64 zoning districts um, to the west and to the east of Broadway, which allow a base, a base FER of 10 for all uses, which is increasable to 12 through the inclusionary housing program or with a public plaza. The Western C64 District serves as a transition between the Financial District and the Tribeca neighborhood. And the Eastern C64 District um, has a strong residential presence thanks to new and upcoming development um, along and on near Fulton Street and Pace University and its dormitories. 
The special district establishes a set of street wall regulations on certain streets uh, to facilitate development that is consistent with the built form of those streets. These streets have requirements for minimum and maximum base heights, the location of street walls, and street wall continuity along, along the street line. While there are six different types of street walls, street wall streets within the special district, only two affect the site's ability to achieve a public plaza bonus, type one and type two A streets. Broadway, for example, is a type one street, so the bolded uh, blue, so you have Broadway, Battery Place, Whitehall Street, and Park Row. Um, it's a type one street that requires a minimum base height of 150 feet and a maximum base height of 250 feet. Broad Street, which is a type two street, so here's Wall Street and Broad Street, these are the dotted lines. Um, it's a type 2A street that requires a minimum base height of 85 feet and a maximum base height of 150 feet. And this is for 100% of the street line. In, in addition to the street wall type streets, certain streets have been designated as uh, retail streets. And those, those are those in red, dotted red. Uh, we have Nassau, Broadway, Fulton, John, uh, Whitehall, and then Greenwich, Rector, and a little bit of Park Row. Um, and these streets are required to have more active retail uses on the ground floor. These streets have been or were intended to be important pedestrian thoroughfares, and the presence of active and engaging retail uses at the sidewalk further enhances the pedestrian experience of the street and its attractiveness as a pedestrian route. Developments that are located within 50 feet of these streets are not permitted a public plaza bonus. The underlying intent was that a plaza would interrupt the strong street wall character of that street or cause the required retail street, sorry, retail to be set too far back from the, from the sidewalk. In addition to the type one, type two A and retail streets, restricting the ability of it to receive a public plaza bonus, developments that are located within the historic and commercial core or the South Street Seaport subdistrict are also uh, prohibited from receiving a public plaza bonus. The historic core is essentially south of Wall Street, um, east of Whitehall and Broadway, and west of Water Street. Um, and then the South Street Seaport district or subdistrict is essentially the historic district um, in and around the low scale historic um, neighborhood and the piers. The commission in its adoption of the special district in 1998 had a stated intent of re retaining the plaza bonus, but noted that plazas should be prohibited from certain streets and areas, such as where streets are, street walls are required to maintain the character of the area. It is generally understood that where a strong street wall character is desired, such as along Broadway, the presence of a plaza on that street would erode the strong street wall character. Furthermore, on main pedestrian streets where retail is required to be at or close to the street line, a plaza would cause the retail uses to be set too far back from the sidewalk. Interestingly enough, instead of limiting the applicability of the plaza bonus based on the location of the plaza, as is done in the special midtown district, the language of 9124 limits the applicability of the plaza bonus based on the location of the development itself and makes no mention of where the plaza should or shouldn't be located. The plaza could be 100 feet away from the designated street, but if the development is on or within 50 feet of the designated street, the public plaza bonus cannot be used. The rationale for limiting the plaza bonus based on the location of developments alone is unclear, and the applicant hopes to begin to address and clarify this issue with the proposed text amendment. To illustrate how the existing regulations are applied, um, I'll walk through some um, illustrative examples showing the intended and the unintended consequences of the existing text. So in this example, we have uh, a zoning lot with 175 feet along a type one street, and then 150 feet along uh, uh, street B, which is not a type one, two A, or retail street, so it does not restrict the, the plaza bonus. So B, A, B, and C have, um, do not restrict the plaza bonus, but type one um, and a development located on or within 50 feet of that type one street will affect a, the site's ability to receive a plaza bonus. So in this example, both the plaza and the development, so the plaza is green, the development is, is this yellow square. Um, both the plaza and the developments are on the type one street. And now it makes sense that the plaza should not be located on the street because Type 1 streets require a continuous street wall, but it's the development's location on that street that prohibits the public plaza bonus. This is the extreme case where the department and the commission uh, really wanted to avoid, but the text is silent about where the plaza, whether the plaza should or should not be located on the street. It's the development that is dictating the plaza bonus. In this next example, the development occupies the zoning lot's full frontage along the Type 1 street and locates the plaza 100, 100 feet away on street B, which is neither a type one, two A, or retail street. The plaza is arguably far enough from the type one street and would not affect the develop development's ability to comply with the type one street wall requirements. However, since the development itself is located within 50 feet of the type one street, the public plaza bonus is not allowed. 
Again, the text is silent on the location of the plaza. Interestingly enough, when the plaza is located in the same exact location as in the previous example, but the development itself, and here in yellow, we have a new zoning law configuration here, is more than 50 feet from the Type 1 street, so this is 150 feet away, um, the public plaza bonus is allowed. So we have the same plaza, the same effect, or lack thereof, on the Type 1 street, but the bonus is allowed here. And here's a side-by-side -side comparison. You see the plaza is in the same exact location. But because the first example is on the Type 1 street, the bonus is not allowed. This is more than 50 feet away, and the bonus is allowed. So it really is the second condition that the, that the, the, the proposed zoning tech is trying to address. To begin addressing this issue, the applicant proposes an amendment to section 9124 relating to the public plaza bonus and these designated streets. What the text amendment does is instead of saying a floor area bonus shall not be permitted for a development that is located within 50 feet of a designated street, the text would instead say a floor area bonus should not be permitted for a public plaza that is located within 50 feet of a designated street, except with a lot more words. This is not the actual text. <laughs> the rationale for making the development or enlargement the subject of the restrictions on the public plaza bonus is unclear since the public plaza itself will affect the street wall and retail continuity of the street. The special midtown district also restricts the plaza bonus in relation to street wall and retail streets, but that restriction is based on the location of the public plaza. The applicant notes that this change will not affect the ability of a street wall to achieve the minimum height and frontage required along the street line and the ability to locate retail uses within 10 feet of a street line. The applicant believes that 50 feet is of sufficient distance to ensure that the requirements of the street wall and retail streets and the commission's original intent for these streets will not be affected at all. The applicant is only proposing this amendment to the C64 district within the special district. There are two C64 districts, but since the western district doesn't have any designated streets that would affect the plaza bonus, it is only the eastern district that is affected. And just zooming in a little more, you'll see that the designated retail streets of Fulton Street and John Street cross through the district, moving uh, to east and west, and then a little bit of the Nassau Street retail street is here, and then Park Row is both a type one and a retail street here. Um, these little uh, these little green with areas with the blue outlines are public plazas in the vicinity of the C64 district. So I'll go through the same examples we reviewed before, but comparing how the existing and the proposed texts apply. So in the first example, where the plaza and the developments are located on the Type 1 street, this condition would still be prohibited under the proposed text. Under the existing text, it's the development that dictates, that says that since it's on, lo on the Type 1 street, no plaza bonus. But in this case, under the proposed text, the bonus is prohibited because the plaza is on this Type 1 street. In the, in the second example, where the development is on the Type 1 street and the plaza is more than 50 feet away, um, on a street that is not a designated street, the existing text prohibited this condition or prohibited the bonus in this, uh, in this condition because the development was on the Type 1 street. Under the proposed text, a public plaza bonus would be permitted for this case since the plaza itself is located more than 50 feet away from the Type 1 street. And in, the, and in the last example, where both the plaza and the development were more than 50 feet away from the Type 1 street, the public plaza bonus would be permitted under the existing and proposed text. Again, so the real, so the real um, case that this is addressing is the second case. So what does this mean for the applicant? So concurrent with this application for a zoning text amendment, the applicant is also seeking a chairperson certification for a new public plaza in connection with a new residential development located on Fulton and William Street um, that they've uh, dubbed 130 William Street. So here's Fulton Street, here's William Street. I'll show a site plan in a second. Um, the proposed development will have frontage along Fulton Street, which is a designated retail street, and will locate a 5,317 square foot public plaza, approximately 80 feet away on William Street. So here's a closer look at the site plan. The development is part of a larger zoning lot. So here's Fulton, here's uh, William Street, um, and then the zoning lot is this big guy here. Um, the development itself is this L-shaped portion. Um, the plaza would be located on William Street, 80 feet away from the Fulton Street street line. Um, and then this is showing uh, the lighter uh, orange is the base, it's about 60 feet. And then the upper uh, tower portion here, which is about 60 stories, would be located in the center. Um, the required amount of uh, retail will be provided along the, um, the designated retail street on Fulton Street. And then the plaza would be located again, 80 feet away on William Street. Under the current wording of paragraph A of section 9124, this plaza, while not affecting the Fulton Street frontage's ability to provide the required retail within 10 feet of the street line, would not be permitted. 
The proposed zoning text would facilitate the proposed public plaza and a draft application for which is being reviewed by the current by the by the department. Thanks. Okay, questions from commissioners. Yes. Thanks, Richard. Um, so let me ask this question. I know this is a private application. Mm -hmm. I know it's being um, used to adjust the C6-4 district. Is there any reason why this should not be made broader? I think that in theory we would, I think there's, there would be a preference for it to be broader. I think it hasn't been studied fully yet. Um, this is a matter of timing. The applicant um, is looking to move forward with, with, with their development. Yeah, um, so the C64 district is limiting the scope. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, Richard, I think this certainly makes a lot of sense to me, and especially considering that there's been such an increase in the residential population, and this is a residential development, mm -hmm. sort of adding to it, um, puts additional pressure on all these open spaces to serve area residents when some of the original ones were designed for office workers. Right. Um, what kind of, if any, public review will there be for the design of this public plaza? You indicated that the application is under review. but It's important that this one be designed for the new neighborhood, not the old one. Right. The, so the, the plaza design itself is just a chairperson certification. Right. So there's no commission review, no uh, community board review. Um, the, the department has a lot of experience working through plazas and plaza design. Um, we have continued to push the applicant to really um, acknowledge the uniqueness of this location and its resource as an amenity for the nearby residents in this changing neighborhood. Um, I think the applicant has made great strides and has really made a um, great effort to really design this and provide not just the amenities that are required by 3770, but to go above and beyond. Yeah. Um, when they go out to the, to the community board, we expect the community board will have questions about the plaza, what it looks like, how it's going to benefit them, and we anticipate that um, they will show the design, that they will okay. um, maybe talk about it, and perhaps incorporate some of their feedback um, okay. before the That's great. I think a degree of um, community consultation here would um, be really beneficial, um, even if not technically required. Mm -hmm. Similar opportunities exist in the area. Excuse me, sir. How many similar opportunities exist in the area for an applicant in the area for an applicant? Yeah, for somebody in the area um, asking to do the same thing. Um, there aren't that many opportunities. Um, in addition to the requirements of 9124, um, 3770, the, the plaza regulations also have additional uh, locational and orientation requirements. So, for example, you can't have a new plaza within 175 feet of an existing plaza or existing park, and then you can't have just a north-facing plaza, and depending on how your zoning law is configured, you're, it's either um, west-facing, east-facing, a corner plaza, or just south-facing. Um, under the environmental review, we've determined that in applying all those regulations, this would likely be the only site that would be affected and could take advantage of this provision. Um, so we do not expect any um, any more or any other sites um, being able Thank to you. use this. Would uh, this be subject to, to the to the current plaza requirements with regard to benches, lighting? Yes, correct. Yes. So this is this is an as of right provision that needs to be um, addressed through the text amendment. Um, the plaza would still have to undergo a certification by the chairperson. Thank you. Other comments from commissioners? Okay, so this item is going to get referred out to the community board for 30, 45 days. And I want to thank Richard for taking quite a complex <laughs> concept and through some really nice examples, making it very clear. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. We are going to Brooklyn now uh, for item number eight at uh, 1860 Easton Parkway. It's also coming back for public hearing. It's a uh, zoning map and text amendment to facilitate the construction of a 10-story mixed-use building with 67 affordable housing units. Anthony Grande from the Brooklyn office will do the presentation. Thank you. Uh, this is a private application on behalf of Atlantic East Affiliates, LLC for a zoning map amendment and a zoning text amendment to facilitate the development of a 100% affordable 10-story mixed-use building containing 67 
residential units and a ground floor community facility space for the True Holy Church and a nonprofit tenant. Uh, the project is a joint effort between the applicants um, along with Ridgewood Bushwick Senior Citizens Council, uh, which is a senior service provider, as well as uh, Brizza Builders, a Brooklyn-based minority-owned development and construction firm, um, as well as the True Holy Church, which is the current occupant of the site, um, and the property owner. Uh, the project is located in the Ocean Hill neighborhood of Brooklyn Community District 16 at the address of 1860 Eastern Parkway, which is the intersection of Atlantic Avenue and Eastern Parkway. Uh, the application involves two actions, um, a zoning map amendment, which would rezone the project area from R6 and R6C23 to R8A uh, with a C24 commercial overlay. Um, in addition, there would be a zoning text amendment, uh, which would designate the project area as an MIH, mandatory inclusionary housing area, uh, mapping options one and two. The project area is located in the Ocean Hill neighborhood, which is a neighborhood in eastern Brooklyn, uh, west of Broadway Junction, uh, north of Brownsville, and east of Bedford-Stuyvesant. The surrounding area is characterized by one, two, and multifamily residential buildings, uh, mixed-use residential and commercial buildings, and commercial uses, as well as public facilities and institutions. Um, commercial uses in the area are primarily local retail um, and are concentrated on Atlantic Avenue and Eastern Parkway, which are two major corridors um, in the area with street widths of 120 feet and 110 feet, respectively. Uh, the built form in the surrounding area is primarily uh, two to three story uh, row houses with intermittent ground floor retail and four to five story apartment buildings. Um, one block west of the project area is the 23 story um, Atlantic Plaza Towers uh, visible in the lower central photo here. Um, R6 is the prevailing zoning district in the surrounding area. And uh, one block east of the project area is the westernmost boundary of the East New York rezoning. Um, and uh, this rezoning was approved by City Council um, April 20th of last year. And it rezoned portions of 190 blocks um, to allow new housing and affordable housing opportunities um, along major corridors in um, these areas, the East, East New York neighborhood as well as the Ocean Hill neighborhood. Um, the block to the east of the project area um, in particular uh, was mapped as a C45D um, zoning district, which is a R7D residential equivalent, um, allowing 5.6 FAR um, and a 115 foot um, height limit. The project area is well served by public transit. Um, the MTA L line at uh, Atlantic Avenue Station is four blocks to the east, uh, which connects to Broadway Junction, um, which is a major transit hub in the area, serving the AC, JZ, and L lines. Um, in addition, uh, the B12 bus line runs along East New York Avenue. Um, and the B60 bus line runs along Rockaway Avenue. Uh, the Long Island Railroad East New York station is also four blocks to the east of uh, the project area. Um, the project area itself uh, is generally bounded by Atlantic Avenue to the north, uh, Pacific Street to the south, Sackman Street to the east, and Rockaway Avenue to the west. Um, it contains six tax lots, uh, one of which is owned by the applicant. Um, it contains a total area of 20,000 square feet. Um, to the east of the development and uh, partially included within the rezoning is a uh, five-story residential building. Um, and then across Eastern Parkway, uh, west of the development site, is a three-story uh, residential building, which is at the corner of Atlantic Avenue and Eastern Parkway. Um, additionally, there's a two-story mixed-use building um, adjacent to that, and, and also two one-story auto repair um, uses uh, 
one of which is partially included within the rezoning. Um, the project area is within an existing R6 district, and the C23 overlay is mapped on the western portion of the project area uh, west of Eastern Parkway. Um, also, the Atlantic Avenue viaduct uh, begins here at Eastern Parkway, um, extending to the east, which serves as somewhat of a barrier between the north and south uh, sides of Atlantic Avenue in the neighborhood. Um, the development site is owned by True Holy Church, which is a local service providing house of worship established in 1952. Um, the site is approximately 8,000 square foot uh, corner lot at the southeast corner of Atlantic Avenue and Eastern Parkway, um, both wide streets, as I mentioned. Um, there is 80 foot of frontage on Atlantic Avenue and 100 feet of frontage on Eastern Parkway. Um, the site is currently improved with a house of worship building um, occupied by the True Holy Church. Um, the existing FAR is 1.32. Uh, the proposed development is a nine and 10 story uh, mixed use residential community facility building. Um, it would contain 50,856 square feet of residential floor area. Uh, 6,731 square feet of community facility floor area and 4,874 square feet of community facility space in the cellar. Um, this would yield a total FAR of 7.2, uh, which would be the max FAR in the proposed zoning district. Um, the development would contain 67 dwelling units, which would be 100% affordable um, at or below 60% AMI. Uh, pursuant to HPD's ELLA program, um, the Extremely Low and Low Income Affordability Program. Uh, the unit mix would contain studios, one, two, and three bedroom units. Uh, the building would rise to 100 feet, which is the max base height allowed in the RAA district. Uh, the ground floor ceiling height would be 15 feet. Um, no parking would be provided for this development as it is 100% affordable and within the transit zone. Uh, so, as I mentioned, the ground floor space um, would be occupied by the True Holy Church um, and would also contain office space for a local nonprofit um, as well as a residential lobby. Um, the True Holy Church would also occupy the space in the cellar. Um, the ground floor would be full lot coverage. And then um, looking at the overall site plan, you can see above the first floor, um, there would be a 30-foot outdoor recreation area. Um, in the southeast corner of the lot. Um, and then on the second through 10th floors, um, the, uh, there would be a setback, setback equivalent to this size in the southeast corner. Um, and the uh, second through 10th floors would be uh, all residential uses. Um, so this application was certified on November 28th of last year. Um, the community board 16 held a public hearing on January 24th, 2017, um, and voted to uh, approve with no conditions, um, 25 in favor, one opposed, and one abstaining. Um, Brooklyn Borough President held a public hearing February 6th um, and recommended approval with conditions. Um, the conditions stating that in lieu of the proposed RAA zoning district designation, the partial block west of the Eastern Parkway extension shall remain designated as an R6 zoning district. Um, the recommendation letter states that the, the borough president is concerned that the RAA zoning district uh, would incentivize development on small lots um, and uh, those developments would remain under the threshold um, needed to provide MIH units. Um, and so as a reminder, um, developments that are 10 units or less or that are uh, 12,500 total square feet or less um, do not have to provide MIH units um, in MIH areas. And that's part of the concern that the Brooklyn Borough President raises. Um, the full recommendation is included in the briefing package. Um, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Anthony. Questions? <laughs> Commissioner De La Rue. Um I'm, I'm glad the borough president uh, noted what he noted. I'm just wondering to what extent, if 
we have any knowledge of the, of the participation of those property owners um, that he was mentioning in either the community board discussion or at his hearing? Um, I do not know what participation they had. Okay. And, and what was the original rationale for including those property? Um, so uh, mapping on both sides of the intersection, um, you know, this is an intersection of two very wide streets, 120 street, uh, 120 feet and 110 feet. Um, and so, you know, it did provide some continuity um, for the zoning district and, uh, you know, that essentially was the rationale. And if I could one more, the buildings, uh, I guess it's to the south of the proposed development site, are, are those included in the proposal or not? I'm trying to. Um, let's see, maybe on this map, so you're yeah, the two, asking the about two The two tax lots basically to the right of the development site. Those two little slivers, yes. Um, so this development here, this uh, lot here would be partially included within the rezoning, but not entirely. And are those rent stabilized buildings? Um, I do not know. Okay, we could find out, that would be helpful. Sure. And then um, what their current occupancy is and uh, Commissioner Cashel. Thank you. Um, further to uh, Commissioner Lewis's question, the uh, building is rather imposing with respect to its neighbors. Uh, also, you made a reference to a repair facility immediately adjacent. Did I hear that correctly? Um, across Eastern Parkway. On the other side. In that portion of the rezoning area. And um, despite the relative height disparity between it and the buildings surrounding it, the community and the, and the borough president are in favor. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Going back to the borough president's uh, recommendation, would there be an aversion by the department in excluding those three lots from the uh, rezoning? Um, that is something that can be discussed. Um, it's a possibility. Um, the, the, those lots were included in the rezoning area because the department felt that um, that area was appropriate also for the rezoning. Um, but, but it wouldn't hinder the applicant's um, project. So. It would not, no. And it would preclude those lots from being, as per the president's recommendation, being mm -hmm. turned into uh, housing that wouldn't trigger MIH. So. Right. It would trigger MIH, yeah, sorry. That, you know, right now there's no requirement that any affordable housing is to be built if those lots were to be developed. So, and, and like I said, today there's actually quite a bit of available floor area on those three lots. Um, so actually, we saw from the architect still in today. So um, this would apply MIH to those lots to ensure that if in the future they were to be developed, it would um, require affordable housing. If it were, if they were to be developed uh, as a group, but individually, it would fall under the threshold. Um, they might not. So as the borough president pointed out, you know, depending if they were to maximize the floor area of R8, they actually would be required to at least make a payment in lieu, even if it was one of those small um, lots. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I think, Anthony, we're, we're all thinking along similar lines here, and I'm really struck by what Commissioner Cantor um, noticed as well is this is a significant difference in scale in this neighborhood. Um, and I think what worries me is that all we're being asked to do here is um, change the zoning. Um, and there's always the possibility, and I imagine that one of the reasons this is acceptable to the community is that it is a 100% affordable mm -hmm. project. But what happens if the site gets lost um, by, you know, to another developer, changes hands, and we're faced with um, a mix of market rate and um, affordable units here. Um, is the scale of this building then acceptable? And I'm just kind of curious about the land use rationale that led to the jump from R6 to R8. You could 
could have, it could have been a smaller jump, produce, obviously producing fewer affordable housing units, but right. perhaps producing a building that was more in keeping with the scale of the neighborhood. I'm sure that's something that the department thought about as you were contemplating this. How do, how do we get our heads around the, the, the extreme change of scale here? Uh, yeah, so one thing to mention, uh, as I discussed previously, was that this C45D district is only one block away. And although we don't have development there right now that is at that scale, um, that would be an R7D residential equivalent. And so um, that's that right there would not be a huge jump to R8A. Um, and uh, there's also rationale for having the intersection of two wide streets, particularly um, having an R8A zoning district, which we also see further down east, um, east down east um, Atlantic Avenue. Right. This one is just yeah. this one is just a, such a hard one because the 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 one and two story context, the the low scale context is so strong um, in the other surrounding areas, and you do unleash. Um, market forces um, that will have an impact on existing residential, which is you know something we wrestled with in the East New York rezoning. It doesn't have any clear answers, but I think it's something we have to think pretty carefully about. Yeah. There are some white tall towers just off. Right. Right. Um, as always, Commissioner Levin took an idea I had and articulated it far better, but um, just looking at what almost looks like piano keys to yeah. the immediate left of, um, of the applicant's um, location. Uh, I wonder, um, and hear uh, the East New York advocates talking about displacement, and wonder if there are any measures that ultimately were approved um, in, of anti-displacement that were covered within the district of um, East New York that perhaps could be applied here if there was anything specific to that neighborhood, which perhaps Commissioner Della Ooze knows better than anybody. Uh, but it seems to me that we're looking at a similar situation over there. Um, um, I mean, if you're talking about sort of just indirect displacement in the area, there actually are some tenant resources that are available throughout East New York as mm -hmm. a result of the rezoning. So free legal services for all tenants in this area are available. But nothing specific to owners within the East New York rezoning. To homeowners, mm -hmm. um, there are a number of resources available to homeowners that HPD has been bringing to East New York um, to like small homeowners in terms of um, some grant programs and loans that are right. And would these owners to the left be eligible? Yes. So um, most of those are kind of um, those programs are available to homeowners throughout East New York, and there's actually some targeted outreach in this area that is not specific to you know our rezoning boundaries particularly, but are more general to East New York that absolutely are available to these homeowners. Other commissioners? Just one more point about those lots. I mean, we do feel that on those 2,500 square foot lots, it's very unlikely that, um, you know, development would be very inefficient on those sites in terms of doing a multi-story um, development and building a core. We do think that an assemblage is much more likely if there was to be development here, and of course then would trigger a MIT requirement. I mean, I think you're right about the assemblage issue, um, that it's more likely, especially given where the market is at in that particular location at this moment in time. I guess, you know, I kind of go back to the same point that I raised during the East New York rezoning, which is, you know, this naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, you know, obviously, the, it seems as though the building to, to the right of the development site is rent regulated, but the buildings across the street, the ones that have maybe one to three uh, rental apartments, you know, they're probably not um, rent regulated, but they're probably affordable, right? And so those, those to me are definitely folks that could could be at risk of, of this displacement uh, of displacement in this scenario. Um, and I would I would definitely be concerned about that. Although I agree that the assemblage scenario is likely. Uh, moving now to the Bronx, item number 9, 600 East 156th 
Street is a zoning map and zoning text amendments to facilitate the construction of a 12-story mixed-use building with 170 affordable housing units and a charter school on the ground level. Hannah Peters will present the project. Good afternoon, commissioners. So the requested action is a uh, proposed zoning map amendment from an M11 to an R8A, as well as a zoning text amendment to Appendix F uh, by 600 Associates LLC, which is an affiliate of Phipps Housing, to facilitate the development of a mixed-use development with uh, 175 units of affordable housing and approximately 32,000 square feet for a charter school in the cellar and the ground floor. It is in Community District 1 in the South Bronx within the Melrose neighborhood, um, and the lot itself is the northernmost lot on the south side of East 156th Street between Eagle Avenue and Caldwell Avenue. It's block 2624, lot 41, and it's currently zoned M11. Um, currently, it's surrounded mostly by residential districts um, and some institutional uses. The um, primary surrounding zoning district is an R6. Um, the majority of the residential buildings adjacent are uh, the two to five story residential units that line Caldwell and Eagle. Um, there's some other residential districts in the vicinity which include R7X, R72, and C62. It's also surrounded by several large housing developments, um, including Via Verde, which is another FIPS development, um, which is zoned C62. It's 18 stories. Uh, the NYCHA Bronx Chester houses, also 18 stories, as well as the NYCHA St. Mary's Park houses, uh, which is 22 stories. The institutional uses surrounding include uh, University Heights High School, as well as PS 157, which is directly north of the site. Some of the open space within the vicinity includes Grove Hill Playground, which is adjacent to PS 157, as well as a playground that's adjacent to St. Mary's Park houses. Uh, the two and five subway has a uh, subway line has a stop at uh, Jackson Avenue, which is two blocks southeast of the site. Um, the area is also uh, served by several bus lines. The major arterials um, are Third Avenue and West Chester Avenue. Uh, the site is approximately a half mile northeast of the hub. And it is the last remaining M11 parcel in the immediate vicinity, um, as most of the other surrounding uses are, like I mentioned before, residential. Uh, taking a look at the zoning change, like I mentioned, it is the last remaining M11. It's been zoned that way since 1961. Um, the M11 area has been rezoned uh, twice, once in 1964 to accommodate for PS 157, as well as once in 2008 for the St. Anne's Avenue development. M11 is characterized as a light industrial with a max FAR of 1, an R8A is characterized as typically t uh, 10 to 12 story residential with high lot coverage um, with a max FAR of 7.2. As far as um, some of the existing site photos, what's currently on the site, um, the site is 23,000 square feet, and it's occupied by a two-story parking garage, which has a capacity of 90 spaces, um, as well as office space on both floors. It also has an adjacent surface parking lot, which you can see in photo two. Uh, the photos show um, in photo three, actually, it shows the 20-foot um, grade change um, along East 156 um, and some of the surrounding residential character in photo four. So some of the, uh, taking a look at the illustrative elevations, um, and I should mention that the elevations as well as the renderings are illustrative. Um, it's a proposed 12-story mixed-use building with, as I mentioned before, 32,000 square feet, approximately for a charter school on the cellar and the first floors. And due to the grade change that I mentioned, um, the cellar level school space along Eagle will be at grade. The building varies between 8 and 12 stories. The western edge being 10 stories, the middle portion is 8 stories, and the eastern edge towards Caldwell is 12 stories. The applicant is proposing a FAR of 7.16 and a height of 125 feet. And then taking a look at some of the renderings, um, as I mentioned before, the bottom is allotted for the charter school. Um, the school itself will be a new school, um, but the operator is an established uh, charter school operator, Civic Builders, um, who are proposing 15 classrooms plus three rooms allocated for music, dance, and art. 
Um, there's no parking required um, due to the affordability and it's within the transit zone. And I'm taking a look at the northwest corner, you can see some of the grade change along East 156. Um, the area, aerial real, rear view, um, and then the top portion is the residential portion. The applicant is proposing MIH option one, um, all of the units to be affordable. 30% of the units affordable at 30% of AMI, 50% at 60% of AMI, and 20% at 80% of AMI. And they've proposed 5% um, of the units will be studios, 35% at one bedrooms, 45% two bedrooms, and 15% three bedrooms. So in terms of um, public review, community board one recommended approval. Um, without conditions, but added some comments uh, related to their preferences, including um, space set aside for people living in the district, um, construction jobs for people in the district, uh, jobs created should be living wage jobs, as well as a request for some kind of resource center based on community need. The borough president also um, held a hearing on February 1st and recommended approval without conditions. Uh, Hannah, the uh, borough president in his approval mm -hmm. raises uh, concerns about the size of the units. Okay. Uh, do you have a sense of, uh, has that been conveyed to the developer and, and do you know what the response? In terms of unit size? Yeah. Um, I don't know if I have the exact breakdown of unit size, but I can certainly have the applicant speak to that at a public hearing. Yeah, he talks about it with some detail in his. I, I do, excuse me if I may, I think Kenneth is referring yeah. to the square footage of the units, not the okay. number of units. Oh, yes, no, the oh, okay. square footage of the units, yeah. Sure. Yeah, um, yeah I can certainly have um, the applicant be specific about the breakdown of the unit size. If I may, um, you know, we know that these units are based on HPD standards, mm -hmm. and I guess what the question, borough president is questioning is <clears throat> the HPD standards, because we do know that historically, and, and they're, 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 they're minimum sizes, and they're done because of subsidy. We realize that. But it comes to a point in time where you have to question, is the bedroom usable, usable? You can't get a bed, two end tables, and a bureau into some of these rooms. And that's the major concern of the borough president. Okay. I just wanted to make sure you understood that. I was going to raise the same. <laughs> Staying in the Bronx, item number 10 on page 293 of your package. Uh, coming back for public hearing is Westchester the Muse. It's a uh, zoning map and zoning text amendments to facilitate the construction of two residential buildings containing a total of 203 affordable residential units. Uh, we received a late borough present recommendation uh, for this application, which didn't get into your package, was on the dais. Uh, the borough president approved uh, with a similar comment about unit sizes. Uh, Manny Lagares of the Bronx office will talk about it now. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, the applicant for this project is uh, Westchester Muse LLC. They're requesting a zoning change from R5 C22 to R6 C24 and from R5 to R6. They're also requesting a zoning text amendment to Appendix X F, F of the zoning resolution uh, to to establish the rezoning area as an MIH area. Uh, also, a zoning text to apply the 3.6 FAR to MIH developments within R6. Uh, this updates the FRA tables uh, in the zoning resolution with the FAR for MIH areas in non-contextual R6 districts. The proposed FAR of 3.6 matches the FAR available for affordable independent residents for seniors, heirs, in our six districts today, and also matches the heightened setback limits applicable to MIH developments in non-contextual R6 districts. On January 27th of this year, uh, the applicant modified uh, this application, and the modification 
uh, the to zoning tax uh, amendment to sections 23153, 23154D, and Appendix F, which, as I read before, is to um, apply the maximum 3.6 to MIH developments, regardless of their proximity to streets, and to establish MIH in the Bronx Community District 9. This modified tax amendment application incorporates an amendment to Section 23153 to establish a maximum residential lot coverage of 65% for MIH developments in R6 that provide on-site affordable units, which is consistent with the maximum lot coverage currently available to inclusionary housing developments at this FAR, and enables the proposed floor area to be accommodated in an efficient building. The project site is located in the Union Port section of Bronx Community District 9 on a block bounded by Westchester Avenue on the north, Olmstead Avenue to the east, Newbold Avenue to the south, and Pugsley Avenue uh, to the west. The rezoning area is depicted here in the dashed lines. It's approximately 16 lots and portion of lots. And What's being extended here is a zoning action that was approved by the City Planning Commission in 2008, uh, which changed the zone in this area, uh, this block, from R5 uh, to R6C22. And uh, within the rezoning area itself, you have the development site, which is outlined in red. It's currently vacant and uh, L-shaped. And within the area, the properties you have uh, Westchester Avenue, uh, next to the uh, uh, development site, you have uh, Castle Hill Electrical Supply Corporation and their accessory parking lot. And again, this is the section that's going to be rezoned to R6C24. The lower portion of this block uh, will be rezoned from R5 to R6, and it currently contains a four-story multiple dwelling you have uh, six, a row of six two-family uh, homes. You have the remainder of the site, which is a through lot. And then you have uh, three three-story three buildings here and a multiple dwelling uh, right at the corner. Uh, the surrounding areas you can see across from Westchester Avenue is basically commercial. Uh, as a matter of fact, a long portion of Westchester Avenue is commercial uh, to the uh, south, you have basically residential in the form of two family homes. You have institution here. This is a house of worship. Uh, to the east, you have uh, multiple dwellings here, and then the rest is two family homes. And on the west, uh, this uh, uh, irregularly shaped uh, block, block here is zone commercial C22. This uh, drawing indicates the uh, rezoning. Uh, currently, this is the uh, R6 C22, and the proposed is to extend the uh, R6 and C22 on the northern portion of the block, and on the lower portion just to extend the residential from R5 to R6. These are photographs, existing photographs of the site. Uh, the first one, you're actually uh, looking east at the site, which is right here. And in the background, you have these uh, six-story multiple dwellings. The second photo here is looking the other way, uh, Westchester Avenue. Uh, and you can see the Castle Hill Electrical Supply Corporation here. In the background, the two uh, six-story buildings. The uh, third photo and fourth are the other half of the uh, block uh, over on New Newbold Avenue, where you have the back end of the uh, you can see the development, the previous development that was approved, which was constructed in 2016. That, was a, uh, this, that is a seven-story building with 134 residential units plus ground floor commercial. Uh, this is the proposed uh, building, Building A, which will be fronting on Westchester Avenue. The building is being built to the lot line, and the... Uh, uh, pursuant to MIH 3.6, you're allowed to go up to 115 feet. This is an 11-story proposed building, which will actually go up to 112 feet. Uh, you have your ground floor commercial, 
which uh, is approximately uh, 7,000 uh, square feet here, and the rest is residential, 82 residential units. Uh, you have a dormer from the seventh to the ninth floor, a setback here, and it goes up to uh, the 112 foot. This is the other building on Newbold Avenue. This building will be recessed uh, 10 feet to be in line with the other buildings uh, on that uh, portion of the block. Uh, it is a 10-story uh, building. Again, the uh, maximum height is 115 feet. This will be 98 feet, residential, 125 uh, units. You have com uh, community facility space on the ground floor level. And you also have the dormer from the 7th to 9th floor with the setback, and you go up to the 10th uh, floor. Uh, this is the site plan for the proposed development. Uh, and you can see, okay, this is building A, fronting on West Chester Avenue. This is the elevated subway line. And this is the other portion of the building, fronting on New Ball. You can see that they have an open space, a uh, sitting area here. And uh, this is what the buildings uh, would actually look like, uh, building A here. And uh, you can actually see building B in the background, but this, this is a better... Uh, shot of that building of the proposal. Now the developer uh, has chosen options one and two. Option one is 25 of the units uh, to be affordable to uh, households earning 60% uh, or less of AMI. And option two, 30% for households earning uh, at or less than 80% of AMI. Uh, the community board nine uh, voted on this application uh, with conditions. Uh, the vote was 19 in favor, five opposed, and zero, ab oh, no, sorry, five opposed and three abstentions. The borough president uh, approved the application without any conditions. Are there any questions? Yeah. Um, uh, Manny, I I have a question about the text amendment that relates to the R6 okay. and the um, possibility that it applies beyond just this mm -hmm. application. Uh, yes. We're creating a new tool mm -hmm. um, that would be available in other mandatory inclusionary housing areas. The way this one is crafted, it eliminates the difference that currently exists in zoning between um, developments on a wide street and developments on a narrow street. And I think you see the impact that that would have on this project because it puts, well, maybe it doesn't, depending on how they're moving FAR around, but um, you know, on Newbold in particular, um, you've got a really a dramatic difference in area context. So, I'm sorry, I'm sort of scrambling all over the place, but I think my, my focused question is the, where else will the text amendment apply? Do we have any existing mandatory inclusionary housing areas with R6 in it that could use this that we haven't thought about yet? No, Howard's already thought about them, so <laughs> tell us where they are. Fortunately, we've done our homework. Um, good afternoon. Um, the answer is no, there are no other locations where this is mapped. Um, the, this, the, we, this is a non-contextual, right. first of all, MAH is, mm -hmm. has been mapped in relatively few areas thus far, and we have not, uh, and the voluntary inclusionary housing program generally did not apply in non-contextual districts. Right, right? which, is, which is what got my... So this is, this, this is, this is um, essentially, this text amendment um, makes the non-contextual district framework match the framework that was adopted in AIRS for, sorry, in ZQA for affordable independent residents for seniors, and then once, you know, essentially that the FAR is allowed for affordable independent residences for seniors, which match MIH FARs in, in those districts. Uh, that was one of the provisions mm -hmm. of ZQA. Uh, then once we've done that, the, the only uh, additional tweak here is to, to apply the um, lot coverage to MIH, non-contextual right. MIH districts, which matches the voluntary uh, uh, lot coverage right. for that FAR. So the, 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 the idea of this is to 
take a district that really hasn't been mapped uh, in the context of inclusionary housing, mm -hmm. of mandatory inclusionary housing, and make sure that the bulk regulations align with uh, what has been applied to other districts. It is a, you know, as, as you've noted, it's, it is the higher FAR that is available for affordable independent residents for seniors in those districts and also for uh, uh, inclusionary housing developments. Um, right. Okay. Manny, just going going to I'm just I'm going to call it the southern portion of the block that in terms of the proposed zoning um, and the existing buildings that are there today. Could, could you just walk us through those properties in yellow, the, the multifamily properties? Okay. The, the, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, this is uh, New Bold Avenue to the south. These are basically attached and detached. Uh, I, I mean, within the result, in the oh, proposed rezoning. Yeah, yeah. Let, sorry. Let me get closer to this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, on the lower portion of the block, you have a multiple dwelling. You have three, uh, three family homes here. You have a portion of the site, and then you have a row of six two-family homes, and you have one uh, four-story residential building. And how many of those are, are recently built and how many of those are rent stabilized? Uh, we checked that because uh, as certification who had asked that question, uh, none are rent stabilized. Uh, that's the information that we okay. obtained. And uh, new construction, there's no new construction in that section. Okay. That, that, that begs another question. Why include particularly the areas um, extending over to the Cross Bronx Expressway? Because you're, you're creating some new soft sites there and you're putting some, let's, you know, naturally occurring affordable housing at risk. Why does the rezoning area have to be so big? What's the rationale? Well, I, I think there's a couple things. Good afternoon, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple of pieces. The, the, the section that is the northwestern portion of the block that has the C22 and R6 today, you know, that was already rezoned, and that does have new construction uh, that was recently built. Uh, in, in terms of growth in this community, this is an area along uh, Westchester Avenue that Community Board 9 has identified uh, as a growth area closer to the corridor. Um, and also the building on the uh, southeast corner itself is actually out of compliance with the R5 zoning that, that exists today. Um, and so it, it, it seems to make sense if you look across the street, you have R6 with the C22. Um, it, it is an area where we have seen um, some residential growth. And I think pushing it towards the corridors um, while maintaining the zoning uh, in the, in the you know, south of that uh, portion of the neighborhood was, was what we were thinking. And it was something that you know, we had recommended uh, to, to look at the uh, other portion of the block uh, that, that's outside of the, uh, the non-applicant owned site. I know, I think, I think we can, well, this is not the place to debate it. I, I, can, see, I can see the argument on the portions on this map to the right along Newbold, but the portions to the left with the, the three two-family homes and the four-story building I have a little more of a question mark about okay and, 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 and maybe this was touched on and, and represented in the vote can you talk a little bit about the vote from the community board and about the five folks that opposed and the three abstentions sure. yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes I was present at the uh, vote uh, the issue for the five abstentions was parking uh, this is within the yes. transit yes. zone, mm -hmm. right? So they're not required to provide parking. No, no. That was the issue. The three abstentions were board members who were relatively new and didn't want to vote. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Any other comments? Okay, well, Thank you. Um, we are going to do the future votes items. On uh, March 8th, staff has prepared favorable reports on the following applications. 
uh, Friends of Crown Heights 29 Child Care Center in Brooklyn is to acquire uh, 1435 Prospect Place for continued use as a child care center. 210 to 214 Hegeman Avenue in Brooklyn is a UDAP des designation and project approval disposition of city-owned property and a special permit to facilitate the development of an eight-story building with 70 units of affordable so and supportive housing in Brownsville. Rose Castle in Brooklyn is zoning MAP and zoning text amendments to facilitate the development of two new buildings in Bedford-Stuyvesant with 88 units of permanently affordable housing. 901 Manor Road in Staten Island is a zoning MAP amendment to facilitate the, the development of a commercial building and parking lot on the corner lot in Willowbrook. And we have uh, the, the United Nations Hotel first floor interior landmark. On March 22nd, uh, there are two landmark designations which staff will be prepare, preparing favorable, recommendation, uh, favorable reports on. Uh, they are the People's Trust Company Building and the National Title Guarantee Building. Uh, briefing packages are in your package um, on page 331 and 350. Uh, no, uh, Chair Lago, we're done. Final opportunity for Well, well done. Well done. Uh, <laughs>